Tonight, it's one year since the Hamas attacks on Israel. We'll hear from the sister of Bernard Cowan, a Scottish victim who died during the attacks. And later, after Dr Poonam Krishan's Strictly Success, we will have our very own Bollywood performance. Welcome to the Nine. A year ago today, at 6.30 in the morning, Hamas fighters crossed the border into Israel and inflicted the deadliest attack in the country's history, killing 1,205 people. They came by land, air and sea. According to Israel, 251 Israelis and foreigners were taken as hostages back into Gaza. Some 97 remain unaccounted for. Israel responded with a massive campaign of airstrikes on targets in Gaza and a ground invasion aiming, it said, to destroy Hamas and return the hostages. Tonight we'll look back at how the October 7th attacks changed the region. But we start in Israel as the country remembers the lives lost. This first report is from Clive Myrie. Clive Myrie reporting there. Well, Israel's response to Hamas's unprecedented cross-border attack has had a devastating impact on the people of Gaza. By the end of January, more than half of Gaza's buildings had been damaged or destroyed. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says almost 42,000 people have been killed, most of them civilians. Israel will not allow journalists, including the BBC, into Gaza, but Fergal Keane has been talking to some of the people affected. His report relies on material gathered by trusted local teams on the ground. Well, since the attacks of October the 7th, there's been further fragmentation in the Middle East. This deepened again in recent weeks when Israel invaded Lebanon, targeting the militant group Hezbollah. Hezbollah support Hamas and have been firing rockets over the border into northern Israel. Iran, who back Hezbollah, then fired ballistic missiles into Israel. Our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, looks now at the multiple fronts of war in the Middle East. That report. Well, there have been memorial events around the world this week for the victims of the October 7th attacks, for the hostages who haven't returned home and for those killed in Gaza and Lebanon. Bernard Cowan, who grew up in East Renfrewshire and moved to Israel when he was 17, was one of the October 7th victims. He was shot dead outside his family's home on Kibbutz Sufa. Bernard's sister, Laura Sozloff, has been talking to our reporter, Katie Hunter. Now, a double-decker school bus carrying more than 40 passengers has crashed in, South, in County Down. The Northern Ireland Ambulance Service declared it a major incident. Our Ireland correspondent, Chris Page, has more. Chris Page reporting there from Northern Ireland. Now, investigations are continuing after one man was killed and three people were hurt in an explosion in Alloa in Clapmanninshire. Emergency services responded to the incident in the two-storey block of flats around six o'clock yesterday evening. The man's name hasn't been released. Stephen Godden reports. Scotland has lost around a quarter of its psychiatrists from permanent posts in the last decade. And the bill for locums to fill those gaps is now tens of millions of pounds. Former patients of a disgraced Scottish surgeon have been promised they'll be at the centre of the public inquiry into his conduct. Sam Elgemail worked for NHS Tayside for almost two decades, from 1995, during which time he carried out scores of botched operations. Earlier, victims were given an update on the progress of the inquiry, which was announced last September, and urged to help shape it. Our reporter Louise Cowie was at today's meeting. Now, 50 years ago, a groundbreaking experiment in one of Scotland's toughest jails divided public opinion. A small band of violent prisoners were placed in a special unit in Glasgow's Barlini, where they enjoyed privileges like wearing their own clothes, keeping pets and access to creative arts like painting and sculpture. One of them was Jimmy Boyle, once dubbed Scotland's most dangerous man. He's now given his first interview in 25 years to a BBC Scotland documentary. Our Home Affairs correspondent David Cowan reports. Next tonight, the First Minister John Swinney's promised to build on the success projects that enhance the economic advancement of the Highlands and Islands. Speaking at the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, he said he wants to see further opportunity in the region. That was Theona Morrison there speaking to me a little earlier. We're going to speak to Amy now and talk about yeah. Scotland, I think. Yes, and uh, it's international... Duties again, another major doubt that we're just hearing about today. Thanks very much. Hello there. Well, we start tonight with that potential blow for Scotland manager Steve Clark, who could... And the one thing for Edinburgh fans, Laura... It... Excellent. Amy, thanks so much. Thanks. 
Now, Colleen Rooney and Rebecca Vardy are resuming their legal battle after the so-called Wagatha Christie libel case, which they fought two years ago. A judge ruled it was substantially true that Mrs Vardy had leaked to the press private information about Mrs Rooney and ordered her to pay 90% of her costs. But Rebecca Vardy's lawyers are now claiming some of those costs are unreasonable. Our entertainment correspondent, Lisa Mazimba, was at the High Court in London. Now, despite poor weather and an approaching hurricane, the European Space Agency has successfully launched a mission to study an asteroid system. It's all part of plans to protect the Earth from any flying space rocks in the future, as Palab Ghosh explains. Well, I am delighted now to be joined by Esther San. So much for coming into the night tonight. You all look absolutely stunning and I feel completely inappropriately dressed <laughs> to be talking to you. <laughs> Esther, let me come to you first because you are the teacher what did you make, first of all, of Poonam and Gorka's performance on Saturday? A moment, the grace she has given was fantastic. I actually hope that these girls are going to show that moment later on as well. So get that, that It's got so much personality, hasn't it? Talk us through that process, because is it telling a story? Is that what we're seeing? Exactly. It's a South Indian classical dance, better than just Mamogni Atam, Kathak, and then Bharatanatyam. So based on this, the music, so telling the truth, in, back in India, the music will come first when, the, when they do this as well. Sana, thank you for coming in. It's lovely to see both of you tonight as well. When you heard what Poonam was saying about how, how four-year-old her would have felt watching. How did it feel to you to see Bollywood dancing like that on primetime TV? Hold, and their performance really took me back to those days and where songs were kind of... Did you enjoy it as well? Oh yeah. Yeah, and tell me about your journey. For when did you start dancing? So, uh, you express yourself through your facial expressions and... ...and wonderful to watch. It's been lovely to meet you guys tonight and to hear more about it. Well, Sana and Tavika are now going to perform Gumar and they're going to be joined by dancer Hannah from Abinya Dance Academy. They joined us on set here just before we came in here to show us some of their lovely Bollywood moves. Right, he's not going to dance for us, but he does have a weather forecast and a bit and of aurora. Vibrant colours to go with uh, that lovely dancing. Yes, this was taken in the last hour or so in Shetland. Wow. Uh, the Aurora Borealis is active tonight and for the Weather Watcher website to see more of those. Good, I love um, seeing them. But cloud is the watchword really for the next couple of days. A bit of rain as well and quite breezy. But the general theme for the week ahead is one of cooling temperatures. Mm. So we'll be cooling off as we head through towards the end of the week and into the weekend as well by day and by night. Okay. Laura. Let's take a look at the forecast. Good evening to you. Yes, uh, some lovely photos. We will see you tomorrow night at nine. Night night from all of us. Bye bye.